You're good. Uh, let's look at one like this. Let's say we want to do this problem. We want to know. Let's say we want to do this one. We want to sketch this graph, right? So, where do we start with this, right? We know that whenever we're gonna we're gonna try to transform a graph, we have to start with a parent function. And so, in this case, the parent function is going to be what? Two, three. Okay. All, all Chromebooks are going to be completely close, please. I mean, click them, please, all the way close. Thank you. Three events. What's well? What's the if I eliminate all the numbers in here? What kind of function are we starting with? Uh, uh, square root. Square root, right? So if we get rid of the two thirds, this just looks like a square root function, right? So our we can write it in general all square root functions. And I'm going to get rid of the a here. We're not going to worry about any vertical. Assuming there are no vertical dilations, all we have. <laughs> assuming the only options are translations and horizontal dilations, then we can do this. So what are all the, the parameters that would otherwise be there? Well, there's an A out front that's going to be 1, because we're not doing anything with that. B goes inside, right? C. B is being multiplied by the quantity x minus h. h. And then we're adding a k. Okay. So remember, a is being multiplied by the whole function, right? So a, when we multiply by the output, it's going to dilate, you know, stretch, compress vertically, maybe reflect vertically. But that's one. We're not doing any of that stuff, so we can get rid of that. B is what's being multiplied by the input. And so that's going to, you know, that's going to stretch, compress, reflect horizontally. And then h and k are just, that's just translation. So those are the coordinates of the special point. Right? So we need to know then what is, for this function here, what is B? Yeah, it's 2 thirds, isn't it? 2 thirds is what's being multiplied by the input. A is 1, right? So it doesn't have any impact. What are H and K? 1 or 0. 0 and 0, right? They don't even show up in here. So the X, X minus what looks just like X? Well, X minus 0 just becomes X, doesn't it? And then if there's nothing at the end outside, I'm just adding zero. This doesn't change it, right? So good. So we know H and K. And we know B is two-thirds. So we know what B is. Now the question is, what does that do, right? And so what we want to do is compare this to our parent function. So let's just take a second and remind ourselves what a square root parent graph looks like. We just get the vanilla square root of x. No, nothing else fancy mixed in here. Just a plain old square root of x. The, it's not a vertex, technically. It's an initial point. The special point is at the origin, like always, right? When we input a 1 to our function, what do we get back? 1. 1. So we're inputting x values, now putting y values, right? So we input a 1, we output a 1. If we input a 2, we get the square root of 2, which is a decimal. About 1.4142, blah, blah, blah. We don't need to worry about that. So that's not a convenient one. Input a 3, we get the square root of 3. Also not very convenient. But if I input a 4, that works great. Because the square root of 4 is 2. So we'll go over 4 and up 2, right? Input, we x value 4, y value 2. 5 is not convenient. 6, no way. 7, no. 8, no. But 9 is good. If we input a 9 for x, we get back a y of 3, right? So that's what we're always going to be comparing to. We're going to start with this, and we're going to tweak it by choosing values of h and k and b for horizontal stuff, right? So then what's that do here? Well, we know b is 2 thirds. Now we have to know when b is 2 thirds, more importantly, what is the horizontal dilation factor? That's a big fancy sounding word, but all that means is what are we multiplying by horizontally? Right, now let's think about this in simple terms. When we want to make something bigger, we multiply by a number bigger than one. Right? We want to make something smaller, we multiply by a number less than one. Right? A fraction less than one. So if we're going to horizontally stretch stuff, it means we're going to have to multiply horizontally by a number bigger than one. If we're going to horizontally compress, we'll multiply the horizontal distances by a number between zero and one. Right? Okay, the other thing we got to know here that we got to remind ourselves about is the relationship between vertical and horizontal dilations. 
we talked about an example late last week, Thursday or Friday, I can't remember which day. If we drew a function on a sheet of rubber and I stretch the rubber sheet up in the air, it's going to stretch it vertically, but what does it do to the function horizontally? Compress. Compress. Good. If I take the same sheet of rubber and I stretch it horizontally, what's it do vertically? Compresses, right? So we know that always, for any function, whenever we talk about a vertical stretch, that always has to go hand in hand with a horizontal compression. And a horizontal stretch would have to go hand in hand with a vertical compression. So there's an easy way to always remind yourself how B works. Because A is simple. The number outside of the, of the function, if I multiply by a number bigger than 1, I'm clearly stretching vertically, right? So multiplying by a number bigger than 1 stretches vertically, but it must also compress horizontally, right? Does that make sense? Multiplying by a number smaller than 1 outside the function would compress vertically, which must mean it's stretching horizontally, right? So this is doing the opposite of what you might at first think it's going to do. We're multiplying the input by a number less than 1. Vertically, that would mean a compression. So what does it have to mean horizontally? It's got to be a stretch. It works backwards. The horizontal stuff is... It's counterintuitive. It's the opposite effect of the vertical stuff, right? Well, now let's think about this in terms of what we have to multiply by. If I want to stretch, like you told me, horizontally, should I multiply by two-thirds or by three halves? Three halves. Three halves, right? And that's why we always end up multiplying by the reciprocal of B when we want to know what we're doing horizontally, right? When we say what we're doing horizontally, we mean how much are we changing the horizontal distances from the special point? So in this case, we're going to multiply by 3 halves. And let's see what that does. So let's take all these points. Let's take the first, this first point here on our parent graph. On the parent graph, when we go up by 1 vertically, we know that that goes along with a horizontal distance from the vertex of 1 right? But we're going to be multiplying by 3 halves, the reciprocal of B. So 1 times 3 halves, that's pretty simple. 1 times 3 halves is just 3 halves. So that means that this point right here has to get pushed to the right, doesn't it? Because it has to increase from 1 to the right of the vertex to 3 halves, or 1.5 to the right of the vertex. So it gets scooted to the right, which makes sense because this is part of the process of stretching out the graph horizontally, right? Well, let's pick another one. So what about this point right here? This second point, a convenient point on our parent graph, uh, is one, phone should be away, it's not away. Uh, the second point is the one where I know that when I go up by 2, when y is 2, x is 4, right? In other words, when the vertical distance from the special point is 2, the horizontal distance on our starting graph, our parent graph, ought to be 4. But what are we multiplying by? What are we multiplying by here in this function? We're multiplying by 3 halves, aren't we? Right? By the reciprocal of B. So if I multiply 4 by 3 halves, well, that's the same as multiplying by 4 over 1. Now notice, this is actually really important here. Notice that the 4 and the 2 cross cancel, right? They reduce to 2 over 1. And so I get a 1 on the bottom and a 6 on the top, which is 6, right? So that one worked out well. So now instead of going over to the right by 4 from the special point, on our new transform graph, we're going to go over by 6, right? So this point right here gets pushed over to the right some more. See what's going on? And then that's really all we need. Once I get one convenient point and the vertex, I don't even really need this inconvenient point. I just need that one, right? That one worked out to be no fractions involved, right? From the vertex, we're going to go over 6 and up 2 instead of going over 4 and up 2. And really, that's it. We know what the basic shape of a square root graph is going to be. It's always going to start steep and just level off, right? So once we know that it starts here and it goes through that point, that's enough for us to identify that graph. Okay. Last question on this first example. Why was this point so much better to multiply by than that one was? 
Say it again. Because it's the whole number. Because we get a whole number. Why did we end up getting a whole number? Though? Because and why did they cancel? Think about why they canceled. Remember, they did cancel. They're even numbers. Why was it? Because, think about this. The denominator of the dilation factor that we're multiplying by is a 2, right? What kinds of numbers are going to multiply easily by 2? Even. By, by, by a number of 2 on the bottom, sorry, with the denominator of 2. Any multiple of 2, right, is going to cancel with that 2 on the bottom. And so this was a really natural case to, to use then because if I'm multiplying 4, which is that horizontal distance, by some fraction with a 2 on the bottom, I'm guaranteed that I'm going to get back an integer and not a fraction, right? Okay, how about something like this then? So this one looks a lot harder, but it's not. I just want to show you that it's not. So let's look at this example here now. What are the values? Can you tell me what the values of H and K are? One, negative 1 and 2. Positive 1 and positive 2. Because one is, H is the number that's being subtracted from X, right? So we can see that, that H is 1 and K is 2. What's B? Negative, negative, negative 9. nine. So if B is negative 9, what's the number that we're going to multiply all the horizontal distances from the vertex by? Remember, it's not B. We multiply by the reciprocal of B, right? It's got to be the opposite behavior. So we know that multiplying by, by a number bigger than than 1, and it's negative, but still 9 is bigger than 1, right? Yeah. Multiplying by a number bigger than 1 vertically is going to stretch it out, so this has to compress it. So it's got to do the reciprocal behavior. We're going to multiply by 1, 9, and it'll be negative also, right? So multiply by, let's call that D for our dilation factor. D equals negative 1, 9. Okay, so now what? So we know that we're going to multiply all of the horizontal distances from the vertex by negative one ninth. But let's go ahead and move the vertex first. You told me that the values of h and k were one and two, right? Well, those are just the coordinates of the special point. Because remember, the special point is the one that's starting off at zero, zero. So however far I slide it horizontally, <coughs> that's gonna be the x-coordinate of where it ends up. That's its vertex, or that's its x-coordinate, right? However far we slide it horizontally or vertically, that's its y coordinates where it ends up vertically, right? So we already know that h and k are 1 and 2, so that's going to be our new starting place. So then all we have to do is think from that starting place, what does it mean to have a b of 9, which means I'm multiplying by negative 1 ninth, right? Well, normally, from the starting place, doesn't have to be the origin, from the starting place on a regular square root shaped graph, we go over 1 and up 1, over 4 and up 2, over 9 and up 3. Do any of those multiply well by a denominator of 9? Well, the 9 does, right? We're looking at the horizontal differences. If we know that we're multiplying by <coughs> negative one ninth, we're going to look for multiples, we're going to look for multiples of nine, right? Those would be the convenient ones if they're there, right? So we know that then this would be a great one to use on a regular parent graph, or a regular square root function, when we rise by three from the starting place, x changes by nine. So we'll, to figure out what the transform graph is going to be, We'll just multiply a positive horizontal distance of 9 times our dilation factor of negative 1 ninth. And that's pretty simple. 9 times negative 1 ninth is negative 1, right? So instead of going up 3 and to the right by 9, we're going to go up 3 and what's that mean? Negative. So horizontally, what's negative 1 mean? Left. Left by 1. So it looks like this. Oops, looks like that, right? So we're going to go from this point, we go up three and back one. Okay, so there's, that's all we need. We know where it starts at the vertex or the initial point. 
we know that another convenient point on the graph would be up three and back one. That's all it takes to sketch my graph or to recognize the sketch of the graph. In Moodle, you get a choice of a bunch of them. You gotta pick the right one. Well, the right one's gonna be the one with a, an initial point at one, two, and it goes up three and back one, right? Yep. So do you have to make B positive? Say it again. Do you have to make B positive? No. Mm -hmm. What happens if B is negative? What seemed to happen here? We had B, our B in this case was, oh, it should have been, what was our, no, our B was negative nine, wasn't it? Yes. Right? When B is negative, what's the effect horizontally? It, it reflected it horizontally, didn't it? Instead of going to the right, it reflected it back to the other direction, and then it compressed it. So it did two things. It compressed it and reflected it horizontally. But we don't even have to remember that, because we just know that when we multiply 9 by negative 1 ninth, the fact that we get back a negative 1, whoops, a negative 1, was really all we needed to know. Because then we know that from this point, instead of going to the right, we're going to the left. And so the graph is moving off to the left instead of the right this time. Okay? Okay, last one. This is like the reverse. So this is the last kind of question I'm going to have you look at. It's something like this where you are given a graph. I think these are easier, personally. You're given a graph, and then you're supposed to find out, uh, I don't know if they're easier, about the same. Uh, you're supposed to find out what's the function that goes with this. Right? So you want to write it in this form. So really all you're trying to do is figure out what are the values of B and H and K based on the graph. And we'll plug in those numbers, and that's our answer, right? So H and K are simple. What are H and K? Four. So, well, H is, it is negative 4, but we're going to subtract it. So that's why I think you probably say positive, right? So we know the coordinates of H and K are just right here. are the coordinates of our initial point, right? So in other words, we know that negative 4 is what we're plugging in for H. Positive 1 is what we're plugging in for K. Okay, now what about B? You have to figure out what B is. And the way we do this is we got to think, this is the final result here. This isn't the parent graph this time, right? This is the transformed or the tweaked version. We started with the parent graph, and we got here. Well, I... I I, I place these two dots on there because they're convenient ones for you, right? So in this case, we start here, and when we go up by 3, we only go right by 1. How far would we normally go right if we go up by 3? 3. No, on a square root function. No, think about that. I've got to input what to get back a y value of 3? 9. 9, so that means I have to go to the right by 9. And up by three, so the so kind of the the key points. If we're going to start at this initial point, wouldn't these be sort of the three first three convenient points on a regular square root graph? Over one, up one. Over four, up two. Over nine, up three. Right. So think about this now. We went from normally we would have gone up three and over nine. Instead, we went up 3 and to the right by 1. So it looks like that, right? Started, this is our parent graph. This is what we would normally do if this was just a vanilla function, but we did some stuff to it and turned it into a 1 instead. Okay? So the question then is, what would I multiply by to get from my starting value to the transformed value for my dilation, right? Here's an unrelated question. I want you just to think about something. Because the answer to this question is really the process that, that you go through. What if you did something like this? And believe me, this, this relates. If you start off with 180 bucks in your checking account, and later on you end up with $150, here's the question. By what factor did your balance change? Whenever we talk about a factor, we're talking about multiplying. So what would I multiply 180 by to get my final balance of 150? How are we going to do that? There's, all, it's, there's always a way to do this. It's really simple. You always just take your final value divided by the starting value to see what you multiply by. Right? That, right, exactly. So, and, and you can think about it, if we want to think about it in terms of like a variable, 
be easy to do it. Let's say we're going to call our final value, call that f. And our starting value, we'll call 150, right? So my starting, uh, no, my starting, I got it backwards, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. So this is my starting value, and this is my final value. There we go. So my final value, if that's going to equal something times my initial value, well, I could call that s times x. Just call it x. x is going to be whatever I'm multiplying by, right? So if I were to solve for x, what would I do? Minus x. <coughs> no, what do I do or to get divide, the x? Divide by, divide by s. Right? So whatever I'm multiplying by, which is the dilation factor in a sense, right? What are you multiplying by to get your final result is always going to be the final value divided by the initial value every time, right? So let's go back to our problem then. If our starting value is 9 and our final value is 1, what are we multiplying by? 1 ninth. 1 ninth, which makes sense, doesn't it? That's going to make everything 1 ninth closer horizontally, it's going to reduce, it's going to, it's going to make the horizontal distance from the starting point only one ninth as big as it was initially, right? So then if we know what B is, this problem's done, right? Well, actually, almost done. We multiply by one ninth, so that's our dilation factor, that's what we multiply by. So don't, this is tricky. What's B then? Negative. Not negative. Nine. Negative one. Just nine. Because it's going to be the reciprocal. Right? So if we multiply if we multiply horizontally by one ninth, then B is nine, right? Does that make sense? Remember that? Because we always are gonna whatever B is. We always end up multiplying by the reciprocal because vertical stretch is horizontal compression and vice versa. It does the opposite of what we expect. So then if we plug in 9 there, and you told me this was, I plugged in, what was this, negative 4? Negative 4 there, 1 there, 9 there. Our answer is just going to look like square root of 9 times the quantity x plus 4. And then outside. Plus one. That's our function, right? <coughs> okay, so here's what you got to do. Go through uh, on the latest assignment, which is 2.3 practice 2. You got to do one problem from each part of that before you do anything else. So I want to see everybody get green checks on. There's three parts of the last assignment. Do one problem from each group, and then you can move on to whatever you want to. Yeah. 15 minutes. How much was it? <laughs>